everyone. Uh, welcome to the Korea UX Expert Dialogue co hosted by the Center for American Studies of the Sejong Institute in Korea and the Korea Studies Institute at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, USA. Uh, my name is Woo Jung Yeop, and I'm the director of the Center for American Studies at the Sejong Institute. I'd like to start by wishing you and your families my personal best for your health and safety in this time. I'd like to also express my profound gratitude to those who have joined us all morning in Seoul and in the late afternoon and evening in the United States. I am very honored to be able to host this meeting with Dr. David Kang, the director of the KSI at the USC. I have a special relations with Dr. Kang as I was his postdoctoral fellow 12 years ago at the USC. Uh, this meeting is to exchange views with the leaders of Korean American society and the leading journalists in Korea to discuss how we further the relations between Korea and the US in the Biden administration. I think this meeting is really valuable since those Korean Americans play a very important role in bridging the two societies. And also people see these issues through the lens of how journalists view. For those goals in mind, I really appreciate the help from the Public Diplomacy and Cultural Affairs Bureau of Ministry of Foreign Affairs Korea. Without generous support from them, this meeting was not possible. With that, I would like to invite Director General Seol Ji of Public Diplomacy and Cultural Affairs Bureau for her welcoming remarks. Uh, Director General Seol, please. Good morning and good evening, everyone. I'm Seo Eun Ji, Director General for Public Diplomacy and Cultural Affairs of the Korean Foreign Ministry. Let me begin by welcoming our panelists, especially those who are joining from the United States at a somewhat inconvenient time, and by thanking Professor Kang from USC and Dr. Wu from Sejong Institute for organizing and moderating today's discussion. I also like to welcome current reporters who I'm sure will make the discussion more interactive and engaging with thought-provoking questions. It is my great pleasure to meet, although in a virtual manner, Korean Americans who are playing active and leading roles in their respective fields. More than anything else, I congratulate you on the growth of the Korean American community, enough to elect four congressmen in the last election. The news also brought us in Korea a feeling of joy and pride. Such success must be the complexity of the first generation's diligence and devotion and the second generation's passion and willingness. Let me start to share a story on the Korea-US relationship. I read a moving article on New York Times last month. It is about former physical volunteer, Miss Naven, now 75 years of age, who taught English to high school student girls in Korea in the late 1960s. Recently, she nearly burst into tears when she received a care package labeled COVID-19 survival box sent by the Korea Foundation to more than 500 former Peace Corps volunteers as a token of gratitude for their contribution to Korea. This reminds us the long-lasting, close-knit, and mutually beneficial relationship between Korea and the United States. I strongly believe that such a strong people-to-people -people tie is what makes our relationship thrive. The relationship between our two countries, which initially began as a military alliance 70 years ago, has since evolved into a vibrant and multidimensional relationship that span the fields of trade, culture, and more. On the side of co-prosperity, the trade volume between our two countries reached more than 135 billion US dollars, a record high since the FTA came into effect, with Korea being the sixth largest trading partner of the United States, and the United States being Korea's second largest trading partner. Korea's culture, represented by BTS and Parasite, 
is being recognized and enjoyed by a growing number of people in the United States as well. With the growth of Korea's national capacity, we have closely cooperated on regional and global issues as well, such as non-proliferation and cybersecurity. Based on our shared values and common interest, we will join force with the new administration in tackling global challenges, including COVID-19, climate change, and democracy's retreat. Also, in the fight against COVID-19, we have collaborated since the early stage of the pandemic, especially to keep our borders open to and from each other, even in these times of border closure and denial of entry of foreigners. Furthermore, when Korean government decide to provide 500,000 masks to American veterans of the Korean War, even in the thick of the pandemic, Korean people expressed overwhelming support. This is quite exceptional and is a true testament to the unique friendship between Koreans and Americans. Recent survey by the Chicago Council of Global Affairs, according to which Korea's reputation and favorability reached an all-time high in the United States this year, will reflect such close ties between our two countries and evolving nature of our relationship to a more reciprocal one. It is in this context that we value your perspectives and insight. I look forward to fruitful discussions on how the growth of Korea's national capacity and global profile may impact Korean Americans' everyday lives and careers, and the role of the Korean government that you think can contribute to further empowering the Korean American community, and also on how we can further foster our ties in a mutually beneficial way. Thank you in advance for your contribution to this seminar. I wish you all the best and good health. Thank you very much. Yeah, David Kang, 그 박사님이 이번 그 논의에 대해서 저장을 맡으시기 전에 제가 성을 기준으로 한 알파벳 순서로 패널들을 소개해 보도록 하겠습니다. 그러면은 샘 조님부터 시작하도록 하겠습니다. 시애틀 항만천 위원. 이십니다. 2019년에 역사상 최연소의 커미셔너로 당선이 되신 분입니다. 그리고 그레이스 초이 분이 함께하고 계십니다. 이분은요 뉴욕 시 청에서 정책 국장을 담당하고 계십니다. 그리고 한기재 동아일보 기자님께서 또 서울 쪽에서 함께하고 계시고요. 피스컬 노트의 CEO신 팅황님께서 함께하고 계십니다. 미디어와 그리고 뉴스 그 회사 에서 있는 정보들을 모아 가지고 공개하는 일을 하고 계시고요. 그리고 정재윤 JTBC 기자님께서도 함께 하고 계십니다. 데이비드가 USC. Uh, we have uh, Miss Kim Gyeongjin of KBS. Uh, we have uh, Miss Kim Minji of Arirang TV. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Jamie Lee. Uh, she is the uh, CEO of the James, James Group. Of uh, that company owns like 30 mil, 13 million square feet of office and retail properties and 2,000 multifamily units through Southern California. And she sits on the uh, board of trustees at the USC. So with that, uh, now floor is yours, Dr. David Kang, please. Thank you, Jung Yup. It's really great to be here. Uh, one of the things I think is a unexpected positive side of COVID is that we can get together this amazing group where there's no possible way that you guys would all come together. You know, we could get you in the same room together. So although none of us like Zoom, uh, I really am looking forward to this because we're going to have a discussion that I don't think we could have under normal circumstances. So this is, I'm really looking forward to this. So first I wanna thank uh, uh, Jamie, Grace, Sam, and Tim for taking the time out of your schedules, uh, the uh, Korean journalists. Uh, so thank you. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna moderate things and we're gonna ask a bunch of questions. We'll do it very open. So for the four of you panelists who wanna uh, answer, just raise your hand or talk. We'll try and do it as informally as possible. And I will only try and call on who should go and then, uh, um, you know, uh, keep uh, be, be the traffic flow. And I'm going to abuse my position as moderator to ask the first general question 
uh, which is um, in many ways, how do you who are really active in politics and business across the United States, have you seen or how do you feel that um, the image of Korea or uh, you know, Korean actions have affected uh, your communities or your business as a, as a Korean American, right? How does it, does it have an effect on you at all in your daily lives or in your business as being Korean or Korean American? Jamie. I guess I'll jump in since nobody is jumping. Um, I think that it certainly has a great impact on how we feel as our identity as Korean Americans is and how it's shaped. I remember when I was a child, um, Korean immigration was relatively new to the United States. My parents were born in Korea and are immigrants to the US. And whereas today, um, an immigrant story or being from an immigrant family is very much a point of pride and is celebrated as you know our new social justice regime is sweeping across the nation and really calling out the stories of diversity and inclusion. But when I was a child, um, I remember bringing like kimbap to school and everybody making fun of me and I had to throw it away and they said it was weird and it smelled and they didn't like it and yeah. I couldn't, I never ever brought Korean food <laughs> to school ever again. It was very much an unknown country. People yeah. were very familiar with China or Japan. Nobody knew anything about Korea except for the Korean War and, and you know, the outcome of being having North Korea. And I think the only brand that was recognizable back then was Hyundai like for the car, which is a great car, but not a particularly sexy car that people <laughs> really aspire to have. So there was nothing really tangible for Americans to understand. And I grew up in the, in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles, which is primarily, is very, very white, primarily Jewish neighborhood. And that's the environment that I grew up in with very little diversity and certainly nobody else who looked like me. And today to really see the rise of K-pop where there are young white teenage girls in middle America who are singing all the words to K-pop songs in Korean um, to see how K-beauty, you know, Sephora, which is a major uh, makeup store here in the US has a K-beauty section and all of the magazines are promoting K-beauty as a place to be revered where all of these great beauty secrets come from is huge. And now, you know, everyone has a Samsung phone or a Samsung TV and brands are very ubiquitous now in America. There is this sense, I spoke to some children, or some children, some young adults who attend the high school that I went to. And I said, oh, is it so different to be Korean now? Because when I was young, it wasn't necessarily cool to be Korean. And they were like, oh, everybody wants to be Korean. It's very cool to be Korean. So I think these tangible things very much make a difference in the identity for people who, you know, I'm very much American. I was born here. If you drop me off in the middle of Korea, I may not survive or find my way home, but I can't ever escape the fact, the sense of diaspora that even being an American, people look at me and I am Korean, I'm Asian, I'm foreign or other to them. I've certainly have people come up to me in my life and ask me if I speak English or ask me, you know, ridiculous questions to that end. So there's certainly a blended cultural identity in being Korean American. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Anybody else want to? Yeah, I mean, I think Jamie hit everything on the head. I, you know, I would just add and maybe specify uh, it this definitely affects our lives as Korean Americans, but in a way, it actually presents us with an interesting dichotomy as Korean Americans, right? On one hand, uh, as Jamie from, uh, pointed out, the rise of K-pop and overall popularity of Korean culture is good in that it creates more awareness of our own culture and heritage. And as a result, I think today's generation of Korean Americans are embracing their heritage a lot more than my generation of Korean Americans Jamie's generation of Korean Americans, right? I think that's indicative of the fact that, like, if you talk to little kids today that are Korean Americans, their Korean is way better than my Korean was at their age. And that's because it's okay to speak Korean and no Korean. There are more Americans who want to learn Korean today than there ever was when we were growing up, right? So in that sense, I think it's a positive change because our generation and the parent generation of our parents was mo more focused on assimilation than uh, embracing our own heritage. So in that aspect, it's, it's positive. But on the other hand, 
uh, and I think Jamie was alluding this, to this as well, is as Korean, Korean Americans, but also just Asian minorities in general, we suffer from the perpetual foreigner syndrome, yeah. right? Yeah. The, this idea yeah. that, you know, no matter how long uh, Asians have been in this country, uh, we're always viewed as foreigners. Every one of us here has been asked in their life, where are you from, right? Yeah. And the problem is that we're not seen as American right away. And that presents a huge challenge for us, both professionally, but quite frankly, sometimes politically as well. Um, you know, one of my mentors and heroes is Norman Mineta. And Norman Mineta, despite being a two-time cabinet member uh, under two president, still, still feels compelled to wear an American flag on his lapel of his suit because he feels like he still needs to prove that he's American, right? And so the question for us is, is the growth of K-pop only adding to the perception of us being perpetual foreigners, or uh, you know, where if a person meets us for the first time, their their immediate attribution of us is to BTS and Blackpink, right? Um, and, and so for us, it's a delicate balance as Korean Americans, right? I don't think these two things are mutually exclusive, right? You can embrace your heritage and be American. That I don't think those two things are mutually exclu exclusive um, because we should stay in touch with our heritage. But I think for, for Korean Americans specifically, it's this interesting balance and dichotomy that we have to deal with constantly. I can just add to that. I appreciate what you said, Sam and Jamie. Um, I think that uh, there's actually more positive um, effects in my own personal life and of Korean Americans. I can just speak from being in New York City um, with the rise of Korean soft power through Korean pop um, K-beauty, um, in New York City, I've never seen so many body baguettes, <laughs> through the jours, and, um, Tom and Tom's, yeah, Tom and Tom's, and then, um, K-beauty is not only at Sephora, but in CVS, Dwayne Reed, like, all of the regular convenience stores is a K-beauty section, my black and white and Latino coworkers, they automatically assume I have a good Korean beauty regimen. <laughs> they ask me for advice. They love kimchi. And um, I think that's really great. You know, <laughs> like people are okay um, having kimchi in their fridge, even if they're not Korean and you know, it smells. <laughs> and so the fact that so many people embrace it and think it's cool, I think has been a positive thing for, for me personally, I've benefited from it. I think where it's been a little challenging is how Koreans and Asian Americans and, and, and the broader Asian American community and especially um, the Chinese community in, in light of coronavirus and being conflated uh, the the coronavirus being called the Chinese virus and Kung flu a lot, you know, earlier this year by many of our American leaders, we were conflated and seen as, a, as part of the problem and the source of the problem for coronavirus in the U.S. So um, unfortunately for the Chinese immigrant and American communities, as well as the Korean and Korean immigrant communities in New York City and in L.A., like a lot of these big cities, even in Texas, there's a rise of harassment towards us and hate crimes. And so um, it's weird. It's like it's, we're being celebrated in many ways with the, the, the Korean soft power, but we're also being put together as like the enemy when it comes to the coronavirus and we're still feeling the effects of it. So it's just, it's a little bit different from Sam, what you're saying about the perpetual foreigner, um, but that we're, we're put into this one category of group and kind of like scapegoated as, as the problem. And so fighting for our space at the table to be seen as like just as American as everyone else, but also proud to be Koreans, you know? Those are great points. I mean, Tim, you want to say something? Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, so I, um, I'm i actually sitting out here in Seoul right now. Uh, and uh, uh, as somebody who kind of goes back and forth between um, uh, Korea and the United States, uh, mostly for, for business, it's, it's actually quite interesting to sort of see the, the developments over the last couple of, uh, uh, of months in particular. Um, you know, when I was, um, I, the last time I was in the States actually was, um, I think right as lockdowns were happening, um, uh, in March or April or so. And I remember uh, turning on the TV to CNN and 
um, you know, almost every five minutes, it would be a comparison between the United States and Korea, uh, which is extremely weird because, you know, um, there's no way that most, uh, uh, you know, uh, most people would ever make that comparison, you know, unless in the context of, you know, why, you know, the Koreans are going off and, and you know, increasing testing, why aren't we, right? You know, the Koreans have, you know, uh, been able to manage the, uh, uh, the lockdown situations, you know, why haven't we been able to do that, right? So, um, it's, it's been actually quite interesting. And so one of the things that I've thought a lot about recently is um, the opportunities that exist in Korea, um, you know, from a corporate and business perspective, um, you know, to be able to drive uh, um, increased kind of uh, foreign direct investment in both directions, um, and as well sort of uh, a sharing of, of general technological expertise. Um, and I think that there's you know, one of the biggest domestic uh, political questions that that drives uh, Korean politics fundamentally is, you know, is Korea a China oriented uh, country uh, or is it a US oriented country? Um, and, you know, Korea is, is sitting at a pretty heavy level of crossroads right now and making that determination. Actually, I would argue that the, the main one of the main differences between the two major political parties in South Korea is basically that question. Um, are you China focused or US focused? Um, and so um, I think that Korean Americans actually, in the reverse direction, um, uh, have this increasingly uh, important uh, mission um, of trying to create better ties between South Korea um, and America, um, because one of the biggest political allies that we have, uh, at least as, a, as an American, um, you know, uh, is, you know, trending candidly in the direction of, of China. Um, and so uh, as we think about, you know, business connections and political connections and, and the responsibility that Korean Americans have, um, I've actually seen uh, a great number of expats here in South Korea. I, I think that number is, has dramatically increased um, over the course of the last couple of months as a result of COVID. Um, and they're finding, um, you know, increased business opportunities, increased, cr you know, cross-country collaboration, uh, joint ventures that they're that they're initiating, you know, uh, investments that they're doing cross-border wise, um, that are driving a pretty significant significant level of economic activity. And so, um, uh, it's sort of an interesting dynamic because I know that, you know a lot of the um, the only thing that I would add, you know, to what the panelists said in terms of the the domestic feeling, you know, being Korean American in America definitely is positive. Um, it's trending upwards, uh, but you know. Um, the only argument that I would say is that the sentiment in Korea actually doesn't necessarily replicate that feeling. Um, and so it's actually a very interesting uh, direction that, uh, of the two countries here. That's great. I didn't, I didn't expect us to go in the uh, geopolitical uh, direction, but the, you're absolutely right. There's, there's a lot on the table when we talk about this. Uh, why don't we go with uh, Ms. Uh, Jung Jae-yoon. Do you have a question for the uh, panelists? Yes, thank you. I'm Jae Yoon Jung, reporter from JTBC. Very pleased to be part of this seminar today. Well, since this is very difficult time for everyone around the world, I thought I would start my question with the effect of COVID-19. Miss um, Grace Cho slightly touched on the subject. Well, relatively speaking, South Korea has been considered a one of the countries that has kept the damage of COVID-19 at the low level. Um, some called it K quarantine. Uh, did K quarantine actually affect the life of Korean Americans during the early days of COVID 19 pandemic? And how is the recent surge in numbers, unfortunately, in Korea, affecting the Korean American community? Thank you. I can, I can tackle that from like a policymaker's perspective because, you know, as the commissioner at the Port of Seattle, I deal with the airport and the seaport. And, and I'll just say that um, I looked to Korea for policies and, um, and uh, regulations that we should implement here. Um, I think for most Korean families, it's true that the first generation Korean Americans, like my parents, follow what happens in Korea very closely, right? In fact, I would venture to say that they read the Korean news more closely than the American news, right? And so one of the benefits that I think our community had during this pandemic is that we had a point of reference. We had feedback and information coming from South Korea uh, that helped us uh, keep ourselves safe and protected from COVID because we knew South Korea had far more experience during dealing with 
pandemics like the MERS pandemic, SARS in the past. You know, I'll just take an example, uh, this controversy over masks, right? When, the, when COVID happened, there was no question within the community, within the Korean community, that everyone should wear masks, right? There was no question. But there, even to this day, there is a, amongst just everyday Americans, this, this weird like fight over whether or not masks should be put on or not, right? And part of the reason why that debate didn't happen within our own community is because we knew that you know, this is what we do, that you know, this is normal in South Korea. And so that normalization of some of these things in South Korea helped the, the Korean American population and communities you know, uh, protect themselves against COVID. And it's the same thing uh, on, a, on a regulatory and policy side, you know, Korea has a two week quarantine when you go into through the airport, all these policies and procedures that were put in place to keep the public safe were things that a lot of policymakers of Korean you know, heritage, and maybe Jamie can speak to this too, because I know she's involved with LA, uh, was something we looked to. And so I think that was one distinct advantage we had, uh, both as a community, but also as policymakers. Yeah, there were a lot of early reports really highlighting the great infrastructure that the Korean government had put into place very early on. A lot of that had to do with the um, creation and deployment of massive testing regimes, and then the faith of the Korean population in you know, downloading apps on their phones, of submitting to contact tracing. Um, I read a number of articles <laughs> regarding that, and I think you know, it's um, very disheartening with how decentralized the American government is, the absolute failure of our national leadership to not only impose universal mask mandates, but also to create a national testing policy, which we still do not have, um, nor do we have contact tracing. We've spent $3 trillion on stimulus packages where if a lot of that money had been put towards developing and deploying these technologies would actually have gone a long way in keeping us closer to daily life. And then the numbers just speak for themselves on a you know, percentage of the world population in total case counts and total deaths. I'm sitting in Los Angeles County right now and I just saw the number from today. We have 21,411 new cases just from today in the County of Los Angeles, which is about the same size as the population of Seoul. I think we're about 11 million, Seoul's like 10 million people. And I read an article last week that like there were 640 cases in all of Korea and the government freaked out and everybody <laughs> shut down. And I was talking to my friend who's in Korea right now, who's he's American and he was just like, oh yeah, they're shutting down a bunch of stuff because everyone's freaking out there are 600 cases. I mean, that's nothing close to just the horrors that we're starting to see here in Southern California with running out of ICU beds. Um, and just the number of cases and how it's impacting every segment of the population. There, of course, have been disproportionate impacts um, by race and socioeconomic standing in the US, but in today's climate, it, it's really affecting everybody. And the fact that we're still having conflict and controversy and shootings over whether or not um, it's scientifically valid to wear a mask or politically valid <laughs> to ask somebody to wear a mask is ridiculous to me. So I think there, there's a lot that has been highlighted of what Korea has done in the news media. And there's still the sense of otherness of, um, you know, when people think about how governments in Asia are a bit more author authoritarian, how the trust in government and the compliance of the, of the national populations is just different from ours. And the sense of, well, the US can't learn anything from those technologies or apps um, or government programs because the people here just won't listen. So it is a bit disheartening. It's been tough to say the least. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, Grace? Oh. You don't, now we don't, we don't all have to say <clears throat> for everything, but if you want to, we definitely want to hear what you have to say. So <laughs> don't feel pressure, but also don't, uh, you know. Yeah, no, thanks for that <laughs> disclaimer, Dr. King. Um, no, it is awful, like how devastating the effects of COVID-19 have been and continue to be in America um, and how we're not taking it as seriously as the Korean government and the Korean public. And I think a lot of it is cultural, you know, being a collectivist society that follows order and really thinks 
there's a lot of nunchi and being mindful of other people in Korean culture and a lot of Asian cultures. But um, the challenge in the US is there's so many diverse cultures and, and individualism is very strong. And so people want to have the right to do what they want. And if the leaders at the very top aren't saying this is um, a crisis we need to take seriously, it's people will just go to their own individual expression of civil liberties. Um, but I was actually gonna talk about and point to, you know, um, Ms. Jung, your, your question, your first question of um, how K-quarantine, which I didn't know that was a name, which is a great name, uh, affected the life of Korean Americans during the early days of COVID-19 is that, to Jamie's point, it did protect our community because we took it so seriously and because of reading the news. And I, I would say Korean Americans came out as heroes, unsung and hidden heroes in the early days of COVID-19 because um, we saw it in New York City. We, my, my family's in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm sure it was in LA too. They were, Koreans were the first ones who would um, create mats and then donate it to people, to hospitals, to frontline workers, to neighbors. Some church, Korean churches would gather and just donate masks to, you know, when there, were, there weren't enough masks going around. They, they said only hospital workers could use it. Um, and we saw tons of um, support and donations coming from Korea over to the US. Um, what Governor Larry Hogan did with his wife, his Korean wife who worked very closely with the Korean government to get masks and the necessary um, COVID-19 equipment in Maryland when our own government would have provided that for us. I would say in many ways, it's like the Korean American community stepped up and we're heroes. Um, and I, I saw in New York City also like the nail salon workers were also frontline workers whose businesses close, small businesses, a lot of them are Korean Americans. and. They were the first ones to donate the masks that they use for their work as nail salon workers to healthcare workers um, working on the front lines of COVID-19. So I saw the incredible spirit of generosity and support being poured out because of um, what, how seriously Koreans take this virus and, and how they knew they, they were like, we have resources we want to give and make sure we can save lives. So. That was the hope that I saw in early on in the pandemic. Yeah. Great, really good points. And one more uh, thing, if I can add though, yeah, also ahead, of how the recent surge, quote unquote surge in Korea is being viewed by a Korean Americans and affecting Americans. It's absolutely not a surge. It's like a tiny drop in the bucket. And what we're really seeing is a migration of people, of Korean Americans in America going back to Korea during this time. So I see it on Instagram. There are a number of people I know, anyone I know who has family in Korea and they have the ability to work remotely um, has picked up and, and gone to Seoul during this time. And so we are seeing this migration of Koreans out of America back to, you know, quote unquote, the motherland, whether they have strong ties there or not. I know that the quarantining procedures are pretty stringent and you have to basically have a family member there in order um, to enter but we are seeing that you know people are coming here and then they're posting pictures all over instagram like my kids are in preschool we're going out to restaurants like we can go to a museum or go play outside and the rest of us have been inside locked in our homes with literally nothing else to do um, and a lot of our schools are closed yeah those are good points at the risk at the risk of being uh, uh, flippant or whatever, I mean, some of you probably know the joke that's going around Korea, that Santa Claus is coming on January 9, because he's going <laughs> to arrive on the 25th, but he has to quarantine for 14 days. So. <laughs> I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but I will say it anyway. Um, yeah, no, these are these are really good things. I like to go to our gallery here where we where we shop because everybody wears a mask. You're not worried about it, right? So. Um, you know, you really can. The Korean American community has just really embraced it. Why don't we move to a question from uh, um, Kim uh, Kyung Jin from KBS, uh, if you have a question for the panelists. Okay, I'm Kim Kyung Jin, a reporter for KBS. 
First of all, I'm very honored to be here this meaningful webinar. I'd like to appreciate the Sejong Institute and Ministry of Foreign Affairs for giving me this opportunity. Um, my questions are about the community. I believe your generation's community is different from the existing community called Haninwe. So in your generation, do you think the Korean American community is better organized or mobilized compared to other ethnic groups in the US? And the second question is, if it helps the Korean American leaders represent their community, what kind of services can the Korean society provide? It's such a, a loaded question. We can talk about this for days, I'm sure. <laughs> um, does anyone wanna go first? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. I, I think um, one of the interesting things about the Korean community and with any kind of immigrant communities, I think, is that there is a very noticeable difference between first generation and second generation, um, you know, from a lot of different perspectives, language and culture, politics, um, societal views. Um, the, I think that the defining thing about the first generation, you know, specifically the folks that came, you know, from Korea to the United States in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s um, in particular um, is that they have very, 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 uh, what I would say is classically conservative views um, on everything. Um, and the large, the, the reason why is because many of the Koreans that immigrated from that time period, uh, you know, came to Korea for, you know, economic opportunity, uh, you know, because of the political instability in South Korea at the time. Um, you know, for a lot of different reasons to find a better life. Um, and uh, that the exact uh, views that they held um, in the 80s, for instance, um, they still hold today. Um, now, for most people living natively in Korea, uh, you know, through the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s, 2010s, it's a very, very rapid level of development in Korea. Um, so um, the, uh, uh, the, you know, in particular, the you know IMF crisis, but even beyond the IMF crisis, the societal views around Korea have changed very dramatically. So, you think about things like um, uh, uh, very po big political views that we hold in, in America um, uh, around things like same-sex marriage um, or around um, uh, how religious uh, individuals are. Um, those those exact beliefs uh, have carried over into the Korean American community in the first generation. Um, so. What I find is that the, the Korean American uh, older generation, first generation, is extremely conservative. Um, uh, you know, they, you know, uh, especially when they're compared to their counterparts um, in, uh, uh, in 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 Korea. So I'll give you I'll give you a small personal example. Uh, uh, recently, my um, younger sister got engaged uh, in Korea, and um, we, you know, we we flew the entire family out uh, to Korea. Um, and my mother really, 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 she's first generation, wanted to do a yakonshik. And, uh, you know, which uh, I guess, you know, to her, which is like this concept of like having the whole- uh, At a Chinese family. restaurant, right? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was, yeah, basically, yeah, it actually was at a Chinese restaurant. But, um, but so, so, you know, the reality though, is that, you know, the marriage customs and traditions in Korea have drastically changed over the last couple of years. There's some people that still hold like a, a lot of the kind of traditional ceremonies, but a lot of you know more modern couples will be very very Western in terms of the way that they approach marriage. Um, but you know, for for parents like mine, they still hold these very very conservative views um, on uh, on tradition and on culture and everything else. So um, now that gap is very different from second generation. Second generation, by and large, born in America, grew up in America, went to school in America, have American friends, you know, listen to American music. Uh, you know, got an American education. Um, and so um, their views are much more in line with mainstream America. Um, and, uh, and so there is actually one of the biggest defining issues in the Korean American community is that divide between the first generation and second generation. Um, you know, Sam, you know, and, and Grace in particular talk, you know, a little bit, Sam talked about this, you know, earlier about how the first generation gets a lot of their news from uh, Korean media. Um, and the reason why is because, you know, to, to your question, um, uh, you know, the Korean ethnic community is still developing uh, quite dramatically. Um, the infrastructure, though, around the Korean American community is not particularly well built. Um, the probably the most uh, 
high profile um, media organizations are very, very limited um, in their reporting. Um, they're incapable of covering, you know, basic, uh, uh, you know, items around, um, uh, you know, what's going on in Congress, uh, you know, what the markets are doing, um, even just basic, basic news. Uh, most Korean Americans in the first generation are still getting their news actually from, you know, from, you know, organiz organizations like KBS. Um, and so there's a joke actually, at least in, in our industry, in the news industry, that, um, uh, that first generation Korean Americans actually know more about what's going on in Yoido than they do what's going on in the Beltway, um, which is incredibly disheartening because they're American citizens that have the right to vote in America uh, that should be following American politics, uh, but also creates a level of disengagement, um, you know, with the current uh, US political system. Um, it's obviously changing, you know, with the second generation um, uh, kind of coming up through the ranks and by and large, you know, folks like Andy, for instance, are, you know, largely second generation. Um, and those are the folks that are rising through the political ranks. Um, but I think that ultimately, um, there is always going to be that sort of divide, especially because the foundational aspects of the Korean American community were built off of immigration. Um, and that's going to continue to be the case with, you know, new first generation folks continuously coming into the country. Um, and that divide continued to widen over time. Yeah, I, I think, no, I think, I think Tim really hit it on the head and he kind of was very comprehensive in response. You know, I think the only thing that I would add is that uh, just to answer the question a little more directly, I mean, we can't deny that the Korean community has come a long way, right? So let's just take a moment to acknowledge that the fact that we elected four members of Congress that cycle um, was a huge accomplishment, right? Um, I think to, uh, to Tim's point though, we elected two Republicans and two Democrats. Right, and the two Republicans are more first generation, and the two Democrats are uh, more second generation slash, uh, you know, Americanized, uh, so to speak. Right, and so I think that perfectly illustrates what uh, Tim was kind of trying to get out here when it comes to this generation generational divergence. Um, I think another issue that we face uh, as a community is that, um, you know, we are very in my in my uh, in my experience as a community, we are very reactive and not very proactive when it comes to matter of policy and politics. Um, and that is to our detriment, right? If you, if you look at other communities like the Hispanic community, the black community, um, even the Jewish community, they're very active uh, throughout the years, throughout time on politics and policy and in their community. Um, I think that oftentimes Korean Americans react to issues when they become apparent and they aren't as proactive uh, and, and, and I think that's a symptom of kind of the bifurcation we see in our, uh, in our community. Um, the other two issues that I think we need to get past or, or kind of work with is the geographic dispersion within our community, right? Um, there are a lot of Koreans in the United States. I think we're either the ninth or 10th largest minority population in the United States. The problem, however, is that we're very dispersed throughout the U.S. We have pockets of Koreans in Seattle, in LA, in Chicago, Atlanta, Jersey, and, and now like in, in Texas, right? Um, but it's very difficult for us to really coordinate on a national level, right? And until we can figure out that coordination on a national level, this bamboo ceiling of us kind of making it to the highest levels of government uh, will be really tough because we, we need to come together as, as a community, as one voice. You know, I was very, I was hoping that, you know, not to, you know, talk too much about politics, but when, when Biden is picking his cabinet secretaries, I was really hoping that David Kim, who's currently the California Secretary of Transportation, would be a front runner for that position. And, 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 and I feel like he didn't get the support that he needed in order to really get him into that position. And that is a symptom of the fact that we have as a community has, have not really come together on a national level. Uh, and so, you know, with Andy Kim, with Maryland and all these national levels, I'm really hoping that in the next few years and maybe with the help of, uh, of great leaders like Tim, we can, we can figure out what the pipeline and that mechanism looks like so that, you know, not to emulate any other community, but the Jewish community is extremely powerful and extremely influential in American politics. And one thing to add to that too is, you know, because you asked about how are, how is our organization compared to other ethnic groups? And I think that we definitely fall behind other ethnic groups. However, those are groups that have been in the US for much longer. 
So Jewish immigration, you know, starting or coming in greater waves since World War II, whereas the Korean population, you know, mostly in the 80s and into the 90s. And so we're just now coming out of this wave of survival and establishment. I think that the Korean American community is very well established in the US now, where it was sort of tentative at best, like when my parents first came here. And when you first get to a new place, you have to get a roof over your head. You have to find a way to make money and support your family. And once that's a little bit settled, then maybe you can pay more money for the education of your children and know that they can have a better life in the next generation. And after all that sort of settled, maybe you think about politics. But I know, you know, for my parents, for instance, they don't care at all. And I don't think that they even vote. And, you know, and they're American citizens. They came here when they were very young. But there is this sense of either I don't belong to this political community as much, or I'm just too preoccupied with other things, just to, you know, in chasing the American dream to really think about politics in this way. The other aspect of it is that other communities have broader generalizations that can be made about them as to their political leanings. You can say that the Jewish community overall leans more left or, you know, other immigrants from Central America that are more Catholic may lean more conservative. But the Korean American community, despite, regardless of even first generation and second generation, even within generations, is incredibly diverse as to where we fall in the political spectrum. And that makes it very difficult to organize. Because even for me, I could be very excited to see a Korean name on a ticket. They're Republican, honestly, and I'm going to speak politically like I'm not voting for them. And so that way, that's you know the reason why it's harder to gain momentum as an ethnic community because we don't believe in all of the same things from a politically, you know, political ideology standpoint. I think ways that people in Korea could help is that if those Korean Americans who are receiving most of their news from Korea were could access American news in Korean language in a stronger way, it would help to keep them more informed as to what's happening on the ground here. Voter registration is a huge thing that we try to do in the local communi Korean community here as far as like voter registration drives for Korean seniors who either don't know how to do it or can't access the materials in their native language, don't know why it's important or don't care. So we've always tried to spotlight specific issues. For instance, if there were bills related to Korea or that would affect a lot of Koreans, you know, coming through Congress, we would use those as um, large points of drive. And then the other, the other diversity piece within the Korean American community too is Korean adoptees. And there's a huge number of people who are ethnically Korean who are living in the United States who have absolutely no connection to Korea or to their Korean heritage. They didn't grow up eating Korean food or even, you know, they just don't have that connection. And that's a big number and a lot of them are in the Midwest. And so we start to see more and more people who have Korean faces and American names and you know, bringing them into the fold more about, uh, and I know that there are programs coming out of Korea to reach out to adoptees. I've seen a lot of those movies where they bring them to Korea or documentaries and educate them and give them that dose of, you know, the dose of identity that they've always been searching for. But I think that's a significant aspect of Korean American identity um, that also should be taken into account. Good, yeah, Dr. Wu, did you wanna say something? Yes, uh, before we, we move on to the second topic of the discussion today, I would like to ask questions to our uh, uh, panelists from the US. Maybe uh, my uh, like Korean journalist uh, would not agree on this, but whenever I saw uh, news uh, with regard to the Korean American society in Korean media, uh, are two things. Uh, first, uh, if there's any Korean Americans that's been elected or that uh, assumed some like uh, meaningful government positions. And second one is uh, when Korean American society uh, made protest or played a role in terms of our competition with uh, like Japan, like Dokdo issues or naming of like East Sea 
uh, or like comfort woman issues. So the expectation uh, from Korea is usually for Korean Americans playing a role in terms of competing with the Japan in the United States and influencing the US government or US politics in that regard. But I, I really don't think that might be the priority issue for the Korean Americans, even though those issues are very important for like Korean identity. So what, what, do you, what do you feel and how do you think that like Korean society's expectations or a view on Korean American society? I think you bring up an interesting point. Um, uh, this is a whole nother layer of uh, you know, perspective, but um, going back to our earlier point about the divergence in political perspectives, you know, first generation being a little more conservative, uh, the second generation being a little more progressive. When it comes to issues like tokdo or uh, comfort women or um, even North Korea, that tends to be less of a partisan issue. It's it, 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 it's it's less of a North it's less of a Democrat Republican you know foreign policy issues in general tend to be less of a partisan issue and I hope Dr King agrees with me here um, but in my experience having worked in in Congress as a legislative assistant on the Foreign Affairs Committee it, foreign foreign policy tends to be more bipartisan and well and so I think you're right in the sense that it's not maybe a priority for us as Korean Americans in the top of our heads because we're so far removed from it. It is an area, however, of overlap between the conservatism and conservative and progressive Koreans. And there are organizations uh, within the US that try to bring up those two uh, factions of Koreans together by using those issues as a bridge. And so while it might not be at the forefront of our minds when it comes to issues, it's definitely one of those things where uh, there's overlap between the conservative and progressive Koreans, and it's oftentimes used to bridge that gap. And I would just like to add to that, and I agree with Sam's assessment on um, U.S.-Korea foreign policy issues not being a partisan issue for Korean Americans in the U.S., um, but I do think that first-generation Korean American immigrants um, tend to care more deeply about these issues and prioritize it more than second generation, third generation. Um, and I think what would be helpful in terms of going to the second, the earlier question about how Korean society can help Korean American leaders, um, including those in, in politics and in uh, policymaking, um, is to listen and ask what are the issues that Korean Americans care about? What are the issues and, and how can we support the issues that you care about too? Because I feel sometimes it feels like a one way relationship. It's like, okay, we're gonna take you Korean American leaders to Korea and then make sure you know about X, Y, and Z issue about Korea. But from my experience in these exchanges, it felt like a one way kind of like educational experience and not a two way street. So I think that would be really welcome so that it, it allows for a lot, it allows for a natural dialogue on Korean Americans providing a US perspective and really being like Korea US exchange and then Korean Americans helping to provide ourselves as a bridge between two countries. Um, so just a suggestion and idea in response to that particular question. Well, one thing I would just mention actually is that there are um, a number of issues that are very unique to the Korean American community. Um, and that I think, you know, in the context of daily conversations with Korean Americans, the, the issues that Koreans, Korean nationals may think are you know very very hot button issues for Koreans actually are not you know to, to the earlier point they're not super controversial and candidly are not um, uh, they, they don't get that much attention uh, because there actually are a number of issues that Koreans and Korean Americans specifically have political issues with right so immigration is, is a huge issue topic right that you know um, Korean national most Korean nationals don't think a lot about but 
uh, it dominates the lives of a lot of Korean Americans and their families. And immigration status, um, you know, everything from getting specific work visas to green cards, you know, um, all, all different elements, um, you know, all the way to, um, uh, 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 you know, issues around discrimination. Um, you know, I think that Korean nationals don't understand, you know, they, they don't, they conceptually understand discrimination, uh, but having never felt discrimination individually, um, you know, and being in the majority, you know, for m most of their lives, um, uh, the concept around racial discrimination is very abstract for Korean nationals. It's very, very real for Korean Americans, uh, you know, in, in, every single day in terms of, you know, when you walk into the supermarket, when you eat at a restaurant, uh, when you're working, uh, you know, with your boss, there's, you know, real topics around discrimination that people face, you know, other issues like education or healthcare, um, you know, people have very, very strong opinions about. And these are the, these are the daily issues that people have, you know, when you're living in America as a Korean. Um, and, you know, candidly, the, the, the nationalistic issues, uh, maybe with the exception of North Korea, but, you know, around uh, Tokyo or Japan or, you know, comfort women and the like, they're very, very abstract issues, um, you know, for most Korean Americans. Um, it's very difficult to kind of crystallize uh, a political opinion uh, about them. So it's a difference in perspective because the, the issues that most Korean media or Korean citizens might, you know, think are very, very hot topic issues. Um, don't really get that much play. I mean, you know, if you read the, the front page of the newspaper this morning, right, it's about, you know, the um, prosecutor general and minister of justice getting to, you know, fist fight and whatnot, basically, politically, I, I would guarantee that most Koreans, you know, don't care, um, right? Most Korean Americans don't care uh, because they're caring a lot about, you know, discrimination. They're caring a lot about education, caring about, you know, all these different topics I just talked about. And so it's just difference in perspective, I think, at the end of the day. Okay, well, why don't we move on to the next uh, sort of group of questions, a session. We'll pivot a little bit away from uh, the Korean American community and talk a little bit more about uh, how we think sort of a Biden administration uh, and a transition in the U.S. Uh, you know, will, will affect U.S.-Korea relations or things like that, right? Um, and um, in some ways, where do you as practitioners see the opportunities for strengthening U.S.-Korea Cooperation. And we've already heard a bunch here about uh, ways, and I thought Grace's point about uh, because I've seen I've I've watched these for 25 years where the Koreans trying to get Korean Americans to go over care about Dokdo, right? But there's it really doesn't go the other way, right? And most most Korean Americans are like, where is that on a map? Like, what is this thing? You know, um, and so really a two way street could be really helpful. Um, and so in some ways, let's think a little bit more about policy or, or a larger sense. Um, where do you think, you know, soft power? Is there, are there things that Korea can do or the U.S. can do to strengthen this relationship? Because we both clearly care about what's going on in America and what's going on in Korea. So thoughts, anyone? Hopefully we'll see a change. Like to... oh. oh, go ahead, Grace. No, no, Jane, please go. Um, I think we're hoping to see some reform in trade policy with the Biden administration. Uh, a lot of these misguided and ill-conceived, you know, tariffs and trade maneuverings um, that the current administration has put into place has certainly harmed um, free trade between the U.S. and Asia. I'm also president of the Harbor Commissioners for the Port of Los Angeles. And we'd love to see an increase in exports of Korean goods um, to Southern California. I think Korea is probably sixth or seventh on our list of top trading partners. And the majority of those are cities in China. But I think um, tariffs and retaliatory tariffs have been very damaging to our trade relationship with all of our partners in Asia, especially as we entered into the pandemic and have seen very lumpy and uneasy and unpredictable um, trade volumes throughout this year. So I'd love to see a change in that. And then potentially with the Biden administration in addressing the rest of the pandemic as we're emerging from recovery from this COVID era to institute um, more of a national sense of policy, cooperation and trust in the government. And those are all pages that we can take out of Korea's book. Yeah, I, you know, as, as someone who also works in the import-export sphere as a port commissioner, I, I couldn't agree more that the immediate uh, policies that I think could make a huge difference for us post-COVID will be in the sphere of economic recovery 
um, and you know the by the international trade. I think one thing that we learned in the in the in the Trump administration, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is that there's no such thing as bilateral trade in a globalized world, right? Whether you're having a trade war with China or uh, any other country, our supply chains are all interconnected in a way where uh, even the trade war with China affected South Korea very badly, right? Uh, and so, you know, remedying that as soon as possible uh, would be a huge boon for both economies. Um, but to kind of answer the question of how, like, South Korea could leverage its soft power uh, with, uh, you know, in general, you know, I think feel I feel like in in the foreign policy and scholarly world, it's oh that's always been a question of like we have this concept of soft power, but like we're not entirely sure what the best way to to utilize it or leverage it is. And and one thing that you know, as I was contemplating this question, uh, I thought of is that you know when you think about what South Korea's kind of soft power is in recent years, uh, it, it's probably in you know K-pop, K-beauty, uh, and a lot of this other uh, you know media stuff. And so one, one thing that I think Korea could do a better job or in, in leveraging their soft power is kind of joining the United States in advocating for higher global standards on things like patents, intellectual property, copyright infringement. Um, since a lot of the soft power from Korea comes from the entertainment industry and patents and copyrights are so important in the entertainment industry. But also Korea has become a huge powerhouse in innovation and technology, right? Um, Jamie mentioned Hyundai Motors being kind of a uh, not so sexy um, car company back in the 80s or 90s. But if you've looked at a Genesis these days, it's like really sexy. I think the Korean cars are becoming really nice. Uh, she pointed out that Samsung phones, or I think Samsung overtook Apple on the technology side years ago, but it hasn't really gotten its due. So it's in Korea's interest to protect these patents and these intellectual property and innovation. Uh, and so I think this is an opportunity for South Korea to really flex their middle power muscle, right? Especially when it comes with dealing with these issues um, uh, with, uh, with countries like China, where this is a major issue. I think the, the problem, so my perspective is that uh, Trump was not wrong about China being unfair in the global economy. Everyone agrees that China does not play by the rules. That's not disputed by any foreign policy uh, expert. The problem was the approach that Trump took in dealing with China. And that was, you know, this trade war on goods, not services, right? We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't talk about the services aspect of, of trade at all, digital trade. And Tim can speak to this far more than I can. But when we talk about trade deficits, we're really just talking about physical goods. We're not talking about digital trade. And so uh, Korea being this 21st century powerhouse on innovation, media, uh, and technology has a, an, an opportunity to leverage that soft power specifically in the international realm. And I think they're kind of uh, on the cusp of breaking out on that policy front. I was just gonna add to, I, I feel like I'm learning so much from you all actually on this issue as it relates to trade and commerce. I was just gonna speak more to the diplomacy side of things. Um, as uh, formerly um, worked at the State Department on US, uh, Japan, Korea, trilateral issues on women's empowerment. So knowing that the Biden administration is bringing in uh, Tony Blinken as the Secretary of State nominee, um, he was a big proponent and le led on the US, Korea, Japan trilateral relationship. Um, in the last two years, he made sure that every quarter those um, meetings happened at, um, at, at the deputy secretary level, right? And issues as it relates to political military um, coordination, North Korea, public diplomacy, women's empowerment, innovation, that was all part of those uh, trilateral dialogues. And I think we can expect that to happen again and be a priority with uh, Tony Blinken coming in as Secretary of State. And so to really take advantage of the, those opportunities, um, not only for Korean soft power to be um, engaged in the public diplomacy part of the negotiations, but all of the different pieces of the trilateral forum where the three countries are coming together. Um, and so, yeah, making sure that Korea really continues to have a seat at the table and um, embraces the trilateral dialogue, I think, is something to keep in mind as the Biden administration comes in on January 20th. Um, and in terms of Korean soft power as it relates to public diplomacy, 
some of the things we talked about during the end of the Obama administration um, at the State Department was uh, being innovative in how we think about this. So when uh, we see China and Hollywood come together and produce movies, right? Um, Korea, Korean dramas, Korean um, filmmaking, it's, it's great to see Parasite, it's getting the attention it finally deserves. That kind of cross section of um, filmmaking and collaboration with Hollywood and Korean Hollywood or Korean um, filmmaking, I think that would be really powerful in how you could influence both societies. And um, yeah, so, so those are just some ideas that, that we had discussed and I think would be great to see happen um, in this new era that we're entering into with the Biden leadership. Um, I guess I, I don't have a lot to add, um, you know, on, on this topic, but one of the things that I, I think a lot about is just um, coming out of COVID, what, um, what the new economy looks like and not just sort of, um, you know, in the context of, of, you know, work from home and all this stuff, but really, you know, what are the industries that, that are going to be defining the new economy? Um, and, you know, as, as Sam mentioned, you know, digital trade is, is, is going to, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost everything at this point, right? I mean, if you look at the stock market, um, the entire stock market basically moves based off of the, the movements of, of technology stocks. Um, and so um, I think that, you know, we're, we're now watching a, a, a complete remaking of, of, um, of the economy uh, to be much more technologically oriented. And, um, you know, coming out of COVID, the, um, the transition into this economy, I think is gonna be particularly important because it's an opportunity to think about what direction we want, you know, to go in, in, as a country. Um, now, I, I think that the new Biden administration is gonna to need to navigate that domestically uh, but also we're watching in, in Korea, you know, as um, uh, the economy itself is getting remade, you know, both due to technology, but also due to regulation. Um, the Korean government certainly uh, by itself has been trying very hard to uh, unlock, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, right? right? Like all this, these new industries about AI, IOT, you know, uh, uh, self-driving cars and the like, uh, but they're doing it by themselves. Um, you know, there's not a lot of collaboration you know, with the United States. Um, so for instance, um, technology uh, collaborations between self-driving uh, companies and startups uh, in South Korea, um, data sharing, you know, between South Korea uh, and the United States could basically help both countries leapfrog technology very, very rapidly uh, to become market leaders in that space, right? Biotechnology is another good example where um, as we're seeing, you know, increases in, um, uh, even the, the vaccines, the way that we approach vaccine development all the way to, um, you know, therapeutics um, and the like, pharmaceutical development, um, all these elements, um, you know, the concept of sharing intellectual property, sharing data, making sure that researchers and, and R&D uh, engineers and developers are uh, collaborating on a much closer basis. Um, I think that that's how you empower the new, uh, effectively the new economy. And, um, you know, Koreans have this huge ally in their corner, right? You know, uh, as opposed to many other countries that they're competing with, they have this huge ally in the United States. Uh, you know, the U U.S. has a very, very strong interest in making sure that um, Korea succeeds, uh, even for selfish reasons. They have a very, very strong interest to make sure that Korea succeeds. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm, I'm very biased in this regard, but I think the two areas that uh, we're going to see hopefully a lot more focus in, number one um, is... Uh, uh, in startups and venture capital in particular. Um, I know that the Korean government has a very heavy focus right now on creating uh, unicorns, um, you know, in the country. Um, there's, they literally have a unicorn counter uh, to try and figure out how to, you know, dump billions of dollars in venture capital to try and create these next unicorns and the like. Um, you know, uh, uh, I think one of the things that uh, I expect a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and startups to push for is actually easing of regulations uh, between doing business in South Korea and the United States. Um, right now, for instance, it's incredibly hard to do foreign direct investment in technology in both directions. Um, if a Korean venture capitalist wants to invest in to an American startup uh, or a American startup wants to receive, uh, uh, or if an uh, American venture capitalist wants to invest in a Korean startup, um, you know, there are significant regulations, monetary regulations, 
economic regulations in terms of being able to, to complete those transactions. Um, for instance, you know, uh, uh, if a Korean VC wants to invest in an American company, Bank of Korea regulations are incredibly onerous. Um, it's very difficult to drive cross, uh, you know, cross-directional investment. Um, and so, um, I hope that you know, as as the falling out of the kind of Trump administration's America First policy, um, and more driving towards more collaborative oriented foreign policy, we can see um, you know, a lot of these uh, onerous regulations start to fall away, um, with the intention of driving um, innovation between the two countries, data sharing between the two countries that are gonna really power the next generations of you know, AI, IoT, biotechnology, which are gonna drive effectively growth for both economies at the end of the day. Why don't we go to um, Ms. Kim, Mun, uh, Kim Minji from Arirang TV has a question. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Minji from Arirang TV. It's um, a great opportunity to be able to speak with you guys. Um, there has been obviously been a change in international perspective on South Korea recently in terms of increased soft power, given its entertainment and innovation and even aggressive testing and tracing of COVID-19. But there are doubts whether this can foster an environment for South Korea to pursue goals that are indirectly related to culture or this aspect. Um, do you think there is a strategy that South Korea can pursue to reach those who don't share this um, cultural preference? And another question is, um, the Korean American population is growing, it's becoming a large immigrant group within the US. What do you think um, we can do to ensure that Korean American voices are adequately represented in the media and policy debates going forward under the Biden administration? Who wants to take that? Yeah. <laughs> You and un you unmuted Sam, so you're in. <laughs> uh, well, um, I think that uh, I, I kind of addressed this earlier when it comes to how does Korea leverage the soft power, uh, and I think you're right in the sense that you know, uh, K-pop and K-beauty might seem a little bit superficial in some ways, right? Uh, you know, uh, the the explosion of Parasite. Uh, created more awareness, but like if we were to be completely honest, uh, what is that really? How does that really translate into leverage or power? And I think what I highlighted earlier about the digital trade, intellectual property, you know, the fact that everyone listens to Korean music, right? And then you bring up the issue of pirating Korean music might be an area that Korea can become an authoritative voice on. Um, the point I wanted to make on this, though, is. Um, you mentioned that Korea, I think Korea's soft power has grown not just overnight, right? We all know that like it takes a long time to grow soft power, right? Uh, the United States for years after World War II has done it through foreign direct investments and promoting democracy. China has done it in the last 20 years through, you know, investing in and giving loans to a lot of developing countries. So we've seen this. But I think the biggest lesson of the last four years that we've seen under the Trump administration is that while it takes years and years and years to build up soft power, it can be brought down overnight, right? It can fall apart at any moment on any issue. And I think both China is an example of how China has invested a tremendous amount of, of, of capital into their soft power and then them being blamed for COVID was an example of how overnight their soft power kind of just com completely fell off and, and the world's perception of China completely changed the same with Donald Trump in the United States, the election of Donald Trump immediately changed the perception of the United States around the world and our global power and leadership was questioned. And so it's the same for South Korea. I would hope that South Korea doesn't take this for granted and say, oh, we have this great South Power, South power as a result of Hallyu and all this uh, power. Um, it's not just about uh, do we have the power and how do we use it, but it's also about how do we sustain the power and how do we sustain that level of recognition and I hope that there are people who are kind of thinking about this over the long term, because uh, I think that's one of the biggest lessons we've learned in the last two or three years is that uh, it takes years to build, but it, it only takes uh, one thing to, to tear it apart and, and make it fall, fall over. I think, yeah, that is a scary reality, Sam. And I, yeah. That is a scary reality of how uh, fragile power can be. And I think one way I would um, challenge us to think about Korean soft power is um, 
how are Korean, how is Korean, um, the Korean government, Korean society using its soft power in order to do good for the public, for the, for the global community? Um, we know that um, Koreans are very generous. We see that in um, the, uh, the international development space, Koreans donate and give so much to developing countries and in the global South. Um, and I think when Korean soft power can reflect what Korean values are that are the best of Korean society, to be generous and, and a good collaborator, good allies, good, good, good um, playmates in the sandbox, you know, um, that even if there are situations where um, Korea makes a mistake because we all make mistakes, <laughs> um, that the, the soft power would not, are, are standing in, in, in the global community would not be so shaky. Um, because our our values are good and reflect something that's good for the public and common good. And I think as an American, I can speak to that as well. I think there's a lot of challenges of um, of American society, but at the same time, some of the values of like just um, you know freedom, religious religious freedom, freedom of expression, um, being able to um, just uh, have diversity and you know all people of different backgrounds. I, I think there are values within the American society that are when when we reflect the best values of our American society, that it draws countries and people to want to play and work with us. And when we are generous, people will be generous with us. So I think. That is one way to think about power, that it's not just power for yourself or just for Koreans, but it's power to be shared. And then when people know that it's something for, for their own good too, that other countries and other people will want to work with you to sustain your, your power, your collective power, if that makes sense. I feel like this was a tough question because we've danced around these issues around soft power and around leverage. And we haven't quite been able to pinpoint this great rise of the identity of Korea as a nation to people because of its soft power and to how exactly that's leveraged into political power or action or representation. I think one thing that we all can certainly acknowledge is that the continuation of that, you know, that aggregating of soft power is incredibly important. So that where Korea is strong in entertainment and content creation in all of these things, it's important to sustain that. It's just as important to keep doing those things. And I'll say, I mean, I don't watch scary movies at all. I hate them because I'm a horrible sleeper, but I saw Hong Joon-ho on the Oscar stage and I was like, I have to watch this movie. I'm so excited. Look at this Korean guy. He won best picture. And I still have nightmares. This was like January or February. I still have nightmares about Parasite. I feel like I was up the other night thinking about it again and whether or not there was someone living in my basement. Um, but I think that, you know, in this new economy too, that Tim was alluding to is that content creation is king and content is king and Korea being more open as far as COVID restrictions gives it this, you know, advantage in being able to bring um, more of this content to the stage and overseas. You know, Netflix has this big Korean drama section now as well in converting those. Because what they used to do back in the day was they would take great Chinese or Korean movies and then they just recast them with white actors and Americanize it. Like The Departed, for instance, is a great example of a huge Oscar success movie that's originally an Asian movie and an Asian story. And I feel like this affinity and what, you know, all of the pop culture references help to do for Korea is break down the mystery and create greater affinity within the average American population for something in a culture that is very mysterious unless you're Korean American. And even for me being Korean American, I, we, I don't have any family in Korea anymore. Everybody came over. 
all together. And so Korea is a mystery to me in many ways too. I've been there several times, but it's not particularly friendly. <laughs> people are not nice to you if you're American, if you're Korean American and you don't speak Korean, people are really, really not nice to you. And so I only feel like that change has started in the last five years or so. I think when I went in 2016, it was like the first time that it felt different and more and more people spoke English. <clears throat> I think the fact that a lot of people in Korea study English is very helpful. I wanted to connect that to, you know, another immigrant population that has been, that's looked very favorably upon and that is less mysterious here, I think is the Indian American population. And they have the advantage of having come here already speaking English. But I think that's been a big advance that the average person in Korea does speak some English. And that has made a difference too in that connection um, here. But Grace touched on something that I think is critically important and what, what may help Korea and one of the biggest differentiating factors is diversity because America does really pride itself on individualism, but our strength and our creativity and all of the innovation that comes here is, is solely because of immigration and because of diversity. And Korea is a decidedly incredibly, you know, closed and homogeneous um, culture. And I see it in, you know, first generation Koreans who are here, like we always just sort of joke like Koreans are racist and they just, you know, ethnically and race-based, it's just, it's you stick with what you know. And I think that greater diversification of the Korean population, which we are seeing because of the exodus of Korean people, particularly Korean women and the women's empowerment movement towards big cities has brought in a lot of, you know, other Asian, other ethnic Asians into Korea. We're starting to see more of that diversification. But I think that that will help with creativity as well. And then finally, just from a growing um, investment in America and ways that Korea can become more successful is I think the trends that we've seen up until now, particularly in real estate, which is my industry, is that Korean funds or you know pensions or groups um, or institutional investors will only come in to super core, you know, A++ um, investments. They just want the best of the best. And we have not yet seen that dive more into opportunistic investing, value add investing, which is where a lot of the returns and success can be. And so I think that, you know, if you can break from this trans, you know, this trend of only wanting to be in the absolute best investments, the super core, you know, Google fully leased, triple net lease um, transactions that will start to see more openings for a greater presence here. And that's, and you know, really money talks. And so I think Korea has accumulated great wealth and to be able to utilize that to invest in the US is the number one thing that will show um, success and more mutual transactions. Good, I don't wanna, I don't wanna cut, I know Sam may wanna talk. We have about six minutes left or so, or eight minutes left. Um, and we would like to get to the last question. Sam, did you wanna say something on this? And then maybe we we'll go to the next I one or? No? Okay. Uh, we'll go. So let's go to the last one, question. One thing I think real this quick, extraordinarily Dave. Um, and uh, we're going to have a question by uh, Han Gi Jae from Dong Ha Ilbo. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to be able to um, ask a question in this setting. Um, I hope this is a fitting question to be asking uh, as the last question. Um, do you guys hear me? Uh, okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, we've been talking about the soft power for uh, for like a hour and a half. And I, I think most of, uh, most of the question uh, already has been answered by the previous question, but uh, I'll try my best to make it as relevant as possible. Um, so I, I want to ask you guys about uh, this, the, this, this long-term strategy to strengthen this Korean soft power, because my impression as of late has been that uh, maybe this thing that we call Korean soft power, maybe uh, too much dependent upon a particular celebrity or a particular piece of art. Um, I got to wonder about what happened to Sai. I mean, he was really, really big, but then he suddenly vanished from the central stage all, all at once. And then there was a bit of hi hiatus for BTS emerged. So in, in that regard, I got to think if this thing that we call a very strong Korean soft power really is something that is in a continuous trend or is it something that you know, just pops up uh, once in a while. If, if, if the latter is the case, then I, I'm really not sure if, if this is something that we can call a strong soft power. Maybe we're just living in a very 
very brief moment where um, some kind of you know uh, aberrant situation is happening. No one knows that. So in that regard, I wanted to ask you about uh, from a Korean American perspective what the uh, uh, the effective long term strategy to strengthen Korean soft power would be. And in that regard, I also wanted to ask if there's any uh, model from other countries that you guys have in mind in in terms of this uh, idea of long term soft power strategy. I can I can provide some initial thoughts. I think uh, I don't I don't think this is a is an issue unique to soft power. I think power in general is a transient thing. Th that was my point. I, but the power in general is transient, and so I think that's just the nature of power. Uh, but you know, when it comes to Korea soft power in media, we live in a 21st century where uh, attention is driven by influencers and the number of likes you have and all that stuff, right? I would argue that BTS is more powerful than Moon Jae-in worldwide because of their influence globally, right? And I'll give you an example. And, and, and what I would like to see from South Korean celebrities and media is to start using that influence, uh, their influencers, for social causes, for to advocate, right? And I think one really good example of this was when, when back in like June, when, when the US was dealing with this resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, BTS donated a million dollars to BLM. I thought that was amazing. And it completely catapulted that headline to become a global issue. That's soft power right there, right? The fact that an organization, a, a group of singers or performers can bring attention to an issue that is hyper-localized in the United States and make it global. That is true soft power. That's how you leverage soft power, right? And so what I want to see is however long Korea retains this power of media and pop culture, I, I would hope that they would mature into leveraging that influencer status for issues like Tokdo or North Korea, but also issues that are beyond just Korea, right? Including the Black Lives Matter movement, and, and other social justice movements. So I think that is ultimately um, how it can be best leveraged. And I sincerely hope, you know, obviously there's business implications to that, right? Uh, you know, whether you're a soccer star who says a political statement and, and gets kicked off, there are business implications, I, I get that. But uh, given the global popularity of some of the, the groups that we have in Korea, I think that's probably where it's best served and that can be best leveraged. Right. I, I know that we're running out of time, so I want to be super quick on this. Um, uh, I think that what Jamie said earlier was right. It's, it just comes down to money. And uh, <laughs> you got you to gotta turn soft power into institutions. Um, you know, big hit stock right now is through the roof. Um, you know, they should be leveraging that stock price, you know, to go acquire studios, uh, to go be, be building, you know, entire production houses, uh, to build entire agencies. I mean, the only way that you create uh, long lasting powers to create organizational institutions and the power of organizational institutions comes essentially from money. Um, now the rising stock price of a particular, you know, companies like big, big hit and, you know, um, Amore Pacific and whatnot. Um, you know, that's, that's a huge opportunity right now uh, from a capital markets and capital perspective to actually create institutions that will last for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, but that's going to take significant business acumen um, and, you know, some real visionary uh, execution by, uh, you know, a lot of the Korean executives that are sitting on top of the economic universe right now. That's great. Any, any other uh, parting shots, Jamie, Grace? I just wanted to note, remember what the K-pop stands did to that Trump rally? Oh, yeah. <laughs> when they bought all the tickets and they thought there were going to be millions of people there. That was the best. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, that was a great point, Sam. Good. Grace? I uh, know. I, uh, I agree with that. I mean, yeah, use your power and your influence for good, <laughs> for the public good. Then people will be attracted to it and yeah. want to work with you. And um, one example we saw in New York City was the Haninwe worked <clears throat> with Al Reverend Al Sharpton's organization to distribute masks and food to the underserved Black community in Harlem. So imagine if all of these Korean influencers and organizations were really serving the community, not just the Korean community, but beyond to the black, brown, um, 
community who also needs it. I think it, it, it will just play to how um, uh, Koreans are not just isolated and thinking about just Korean issues and themselves, but is a very generous country and culture that wants to um, help other humankind. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's great. Thank you, Grace. Um, before I turn it over to Dr. Wu for the final thing, let me thank, first of all, uh, Sam, Tim, Jamie, and Grace, because you guys are all super busy and super powerful. So thank you for spending an hour and a half with us. Uh, thanks also to the, to the four wonderful um, uh, journalists for joining us as well. I think this has been really interesting. Uh, so thank you all. And now let me turn it over to Dr. Wu for the final closing comments, if you have any. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kang, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, from your uh, busy schedules. Uh, there's uh, nothing much that I would want to add uh, on top of that. And uh, please stay safe. And uh, this, this session was way more interesting than I expected. This is like six, uh, a virtual meeting that I have in the last two weeks, but th 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 this was the most interesting uh, session. And I hope that I would get more fund from MOFA to get uh, these kind of meetings in the near future in 2021. Oh, stay safe and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you everyone.